We want to welcome you again to Milestone. Thank you for joining us this weekend. I want to welcome those of you watching online, wherever you may be, maybe on vacation, maybe at home, taking care of a, of a sickness or a loved one. However you're joining us, we're glad that you're here with us as we're finishing up our Discover Your Design series together. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. That's where we're going to be looking today. It's going to take us a minute to get there. But before we get to that and before we finish up the series, I do want to celebrate, as we've been doing all throughout the service, this weekend we're celebrating our country, praying for our country, believing for uh, God's hand to continue to move in our country. I know sometimes, especially right now with all the turbulence and things that are happening, we're trying to wrestle through what does that look like. But when you think about America, really, you know, one, his, one historian said it this way, America is like a great experiment. Really no other country in the history of the world like it in terms of its origins, in terms of the principles, the ideals, the values. And so we want to take a moment to honor those who went before us, who, who paid a price for us to enjoy what we enjoy, but also we look ahead with hope towards the future, asking God to continue to move in our country, in our land. I was reminded this week of what Dr. King said in one of his speeches. He said, all we ask of America is this, be what you are on paper. Right, This idea that we're aspiring to be a place of freedom and brotherhood and, and considering for others and, and liberty and justice and equality for all. And as we're working towards that, we're grateful for our past and what we've done, but we're also looking forward with hope and expectation. You know, this year it's a little bit different than a lot of years. Now I know you guys are a later service, so maybe you were up late last night. I know my neighbors, they were up late. <laughs> You ever, you've seen these like at home fireworks that what they have now is crazy. They got those big old tubes and you drop like croquet balls in there and, and there's no licensing. It's just kind of like figure it out, you know, like the favorite holiday of pyros everywhere. And um, one year we were doing that with those tubes and those croquet balls and the guy didn't set the tube right. And it was like the ultimate 3D experience for fireworks because they're supposed to shoot up 50 feet or 100 feet and explode. These shot up like 10 feet and exploded. You are in the fireworks. But I thought, you know, it's not a normal year. So I thought, I'd, you know, I, I talked to our team. We thought we'd celebrate a little bit differently. So I, I, got, I got this for all of us to enjoy together. Let's watch this. Yeah. I'm in the finale with you right here. Like, we're experiencing it together. I thought, you know, you couldn't go to fireworks, we just brought the fireworks to you. If someone asked you, how's that message, you could at least tell them it was explosive. That may be the only thing you get out of it, but it's something to think about. Here's what we're saying. What we want for America is what we want for each and every one of us, to be what God created us to be, to, to reach our maximum potential, to be the kinds of people, to use our gifts, to serve others, to love others, to our ultimate expression, and that's what we've been doing together in the series. This idea, we started with this idea that each of us are uniquely created. There's never been another you. You're the only you who's ever existed. You have a unique combination of giftings and experience and personalities, and God sees you as his masterpiece, and he wants to work in you and through you. And this idea that these gifts that we all like to take assessments for, whether it's Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or Strength Finder, you got your own favorite one, and as we're all trying to become the best version of ourselves, we acknowledge from the beginning that God is the one who creates us with a purpose and a design, and he wants to work in us and through us. And so we've been talking about how those gifts work and what those gifts are and how we strengthen those gifts. In a couple weeks, we gave you a chart. We got real technical, and we hope you would talk about it with your small group or your family, and I know many of you did. Last week, we talked about how relationships, really our health and our relationships really impact our ability to use our gifts. And really, one of the things that we learn is as we study our gifts, it's not just about us understanding our gifts, but it's about understanding the gifts of the people in our lives and how do we serve them and help them to reach their full potential. And as we finish the series this week, I wanna make sure we think about this. Yes, our gifts are technical. Yes, our gifts are relational. But make no mistake, our gifts, first and foremost, are spiritual. And they require spiritual maturity to use them well. And they come out of our spiritual health and our spiritual being. Now sometimes when we talk about technical things, we understand that. When we talk about relational things, we don't always get it right, but we know what we mean. Sometimes when we talk about spiritual life, it's a little bit harder, it's a little bit more mysterious. We don't know exactly how that works. We don't know how to really work harder or try more in those areas. 
but we want to do well. We want to really be of significance. We want our gifts to make an impact. Like many of you, I'm sure, my older kids and I watched Hamilton this weekend, and one of the things about Hamilton, which if you don't know what that is, I'm trying to been explaining it in services, it's a hip-hop opera about the founding fathers, you know, that same old story. And um, the, one of the themes in this, in this play, the, one of the reasons why it resonates with people is this idea of you're not gonna throw away your shot, you've got this opportunity, you've got this moment because history has its eyes on you, right? We, there's something in us that longs for significance, something in us that says, I don't want my life to just exist, I wanna make the most of the moment I've been given, and we watch a performance like that, and it's inspiring, because you think about the flawed and challenged, and however historically accurate it is or isn't, there's this sense in all of us that we want our lives to make a difference, and when we come to spiritual things, sometimes we struggle, and we're like, I don't even know how that works. Like some of you, I'm sure, I'm scrappy. I know how to try hard, or when all else fails, you just work harder. That's one of the things that that I've kind of approached life that way. A few years ago, uh, my family got me an Apple Watch, and I kind of have a love-hate relationship with my Apple Watch. My son, Elijah, said, Dad, you're kind of a little weird with that. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, there are times at like 11.30 when you're out walking in the neighborhood. And I'm like, well, son, I'm trying to close my rings. Right? You know this? You have the rings. The watch will tell you, hey, Jed. My watch actually calls me Jedster. I set it up that way, but it's inspiring. So the watch will be like, Jedster, it'll give you an alert. I may get an alert during the message and be like, your rings are usually further ahead. Now, the rings are your exercise minutes, your motion, how many times you stand up. It's trying to get you to live this active, healthy life. And I'm the kind of person that you motivate me by challenging me like, I bet you can't do this. So every month, the watch gives me a new goal. This month, the watch said, Jed, you've got to walk 176 miles. And I was like, I can do that. I don't know why it's 176, but we're going to get that award because we've got an award every month in a row for like 16 months, and we're not breaking that string. And my son will be like, see, Dad, that's weird. Not everybody acts like that. But you think if I try harder, I can control it. But there's lots of things in life we can't control. During quarantine, we've had some family movie nights, some times where we gather around and together, and sometimes we gather as a family, and I really only have two speeds, stop and go. And so when we gather as a family to watch a show together, there are these moments when I feel like the whole family's looking at me, and the reason I feel like that is because they are, and the reason that they're looking at me is because I've fallen asleep during the show or the movie, and now I'm snoring. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not snoring, I'm breathing loudly. They're like, Dad, you snore loud, it was. I was like, no, no, I didn't fall asleep, I'm watching, I'm paying attention. You can't, I can't control it. I'm like, sorry guys, I wasn't trying to move, ruin family movie night, I just fall asleep because I exercise so much. <laughs> Call it a weakness, right? Like, those of you watching online, maybe you're in that same boat with me. But, but what we try to do is, I'll work hard and I'll control it, but there's some things spiritually in our lives that don't work that way. And so how do we cooperate? How do we participate with what God's trying to do in us? And one of the things in this series is we look to Jesus and we think about the subject. Jesus always reminds us. See, what we try to do is we try to control Okay, you have this gift and I have this gift and we try to put ourselves in a box or we put somebody else in a box and you have this gift and you should work it this way and you have this gift and, and, and sometimes we even go to this place where we go, okay, here's the problem in our world is the, there's good people and there's bad people and we try to put people in boxes because if they'll just do what we tell them to do, then everything will work out right in the world. And the reason we do this is because it's in our human flawed nature because they did it in Jesus' day. See, when Jesus showed up on the scene, there was a whole group of people who go, Jesus, we're so glad you're here. Here's what you should do. Get rid of the Romans. And then another group would say, no, 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 the real problem is the Pharisees. And if we get rid of the Pharisees, then the world will work the way it's supposed to work. Or, or they would go, there's one time Jesus and his people, or his disciples, they're walking along. And his disciples are like, we're on this road, Jesus. We're headed to this place called Samaria. And we don't want to go there because the people who are there they are, they're evil, they're broken, they're flawed. We don't even want to walk through their neighborhood because those people used to be like us and now they're not, they're half-breeds and there was this incredible racial tension. And so the disciples thought the right thing to do was to go around it and not even go near it. And the thing I love about Jesus is 
Jesus doesn't put people in boxes. Jesus doesn't go, well, these are the good people and these are the bad people. Jesus goes, every person is created in the image of God and has this redemptive potential. Every person is broken and flawed, but I see past their flaws to what God created them to be. People would say, well, tax collectors are terrible. They take all our money, and Jesus would go, I'm going to your house, Zacchaeus, and I'm gonna talk to you about how you were created. They would say, well, centurions are terrible. They abuse us and they're difficult. And Jesus would look at a centurion and say, you have more faith than anyone else in Israel. He would consistently confound back to this idea of Samaria. And I know this was just the people of the Bible. It's not like the people in our world because we've stopped putting people in boxes. If you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. We still do this all the time. Social media has empowered us like never before to go, these are the good people, these are the bad people, and if the world would just do what I say from my computer or from my phone, then everything would work out great, but real life doesn't work that way, and we're so glad that Jesus doesn't work this way. He tells his disciples, guys, we're going to Samaria, and we're gonna find a woman, and not just any woman, but a woman who's had five husbands, and the guy she's living with right now is not even her husband, and the disciples are like, why would we do that? Jesus, what's wrong with you? And Jesus would say, because I see gifts in people that you can't see. And when we think about what does it mean to say that our gifts are spiritual, we have to do what they had to learn how to do. We have to lean into Jesus. We have to let Jesus form the way that we see the gifts in ourselves and the gifts in other people because if we just look technically, if we just look relationally, if we don't look spiritually through eyes of faith, we'll miss it and we'll miss the hope that all of us are longing for on the inside of us. Jesus takes us to people and places we wouldn't choose on our own, and he brings people who look like outsiders, like they would never have anything in common, and he brings them together through his power and through his spirit, which brings us back to James chapter one. You say, Jed, there's so much going wrong in the world. There's so many challenges that we're facing. I'm just trying to survive. I got a job crisis, I got a family crisis, I got a health crisis. You saw all those needs. Jed, why in the middle of all these needs would you talk to us about using your gifts? Isn't that like extra? That's only for the people who have their whole lives figured out. Well, if you think that way, I totally understand because most of us think I'll get around to it when everything else in my life lines up. The problem is, and you know this online, very rarely does life ever line up. The good news is every time the Bible talks about gifts, including James 1, It talks about it in the context of challenges, struggles, impossibilities, persecution, threats. Here's the idea. Your gifts aren't just something that extra really spiritual people do. Your gifts are an expression of the grace of God which gives you the ability to live above the challenges and the problems, whether you're in a pandemic, a plague, a crisis, whatever that may look like. James 1, now you're like, who's this James guy? Well, he happens to be Jesus' younger brother. And he was a leader in the church in Jerusalem, not because of nepotism. Here's the interesting thing about James. As far as we could tell, James was never a disciple. James was not a follower of his big brother as the Lord and Messiah while his big brother was doing ministry. It happened after. He shows up as a leader in the early church. I think it's so funny when you think about this that during his life, you you think about the problems and pressures. I don't know if anybody in here is a younger brother. I myself am a younger brother. I can't imagine having Jesus as an older brother. Imagine what that would have been like. Your mom's like, hey, why can't you be like your older brother, (laughs) right? Like, well, he kind of died on the cross and rose again. You know, he's kind of savior of the world. I'm just trying to live in his shadow, right? That would have been challenging. You think about the hurts, the pains. There was a time in the Bible where Jesus and his family, his mom and his brothers, they needed him, so they called to ask for him, and Jesus' response was not to drop everything and go meet their needs. Jesus' response was like, he looked around, and he's like, these people who are listening to me, who are doing the will of God, that's my brother and my sister and my mother. That's intense. I hope he didn't say that on Mother's Day. That would have been extra intense. But somehow, 
James, after Jesus rises from the dead, does what he said he would do, appears to his disciples. Somewhere along the way, James goes, you're not just my brother, you're Messiah. I, I surrender my life to you. I follow you as Lord. He becomes a leader in the church, and on the basis of his character, he's viewed as James the wise or James the just. And this letter that we're reading from is his letter to a group of people who are suffering persecution and challenges. You probably, if you know anything about the book of James, most people know James, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of any kind. That's the context for where we pick up verse 13. Look what it says. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each of us is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desire and enticed. Think about this. I don't know about you, but I have this tendency when something difficult happens in my life, my first human instinct is, whose fault is it? When I go through a difficulty, when I go through a challenge, my first thing is to point a finger at someone. Whose fault is it that I'm going through a difficult time? It's gotta be the government or, my, or that person at work or that family member. We wanna blame someone for the challenges we experience in life. And what the Bible is telling us through James here is, don't blame other people. Don't blame God. That word temptation is the same word for test or trial. When you go through something, before you start blaming everyone, instead of looking at everyone else, look at yourself and saying, what in me is being, what desire, what challenge, what flaw is being, what a powerful word picture, dragged away in the circumstance. Because whenever we face challenges, whenever we face trials, one of the first things all of us do is we wanna blame, we wanna point fingers, we wanna find fault instead of saying, what is my responsibility in each of this? Look what he goes on to say. He said, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. There's this process. Trial leads to temptation, temptation leads to desire, desire leads to sin, and sin leads to death. He's giving us clues to say, wherever you find yourself in that process, stop. When you find yourself tried or tempted, when you find yourself enticed or dragged away, wherever you're at, stop. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. I like that. Why does he say don't be deceived? He calls us his brothers and sisters. It's an affectionate term. He's trying to encourage us. Why does he have to tell us don't be deceived? Because all of us are deceived all the time. A couple weeks ago in the early part of this series, I talked about what scientists call cognitive bias. And cognitive bias is a fancy phrase that simply means a blind spot, a way in your mind that you see things wrong and you don't know that you're seeing them wrong. And so far, scientists have discovered more than 200 variations of cognitive bias that affect all of us. So when James is saying, don't be deceived, he's saying it for a reason because we all know right now, we live in a world with lots of misinformation out there. One of my favorite quotes of the recent years, don't trust what you read on the internet, Abraham Lincoln, right? Stop, okay. The internet didn't exist when Abraham Lincoln, he couldn't have said that. Anyways, okay, back to the Bible. Don't be deceived, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good gift, every gift you have, that gift God put inside you, the gift of the ability to, to serve, to give, to lead, to, to, to be prophetic in your outlook on life, to, to teach, whatever that gift is, a gift of hospitality, a gift of encouragement, whatever that gift is, you're not the source of that gift. That gift came down from heaven to you as an expression of his grace. He does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Sometimes first fruits, this idea, it's a heavily uh, ag uh, agrarian or agricultural metaphor. You know, my dad was really into gardening. I'm not really much into gardening. My dad could look at a tree and he'd be like, that's a Japanese maple, son. I would be like, I didn't know that was Japanese or a maple. I was like, I'm not really great at identifying trees, except for here's the one time where I could identify trees. When I lived in California, there was an orange tree and a lemon tree in the backyard, and I know that they were orange trees and lemon trees because they had lots of oranges and lemons on them. That's about the length of my deductive ability when it comes to agriculture. The fruit on the tree tells you what kind of tree it is. That's the metaphor James is giving us. 
you want to know if you're a follower of Christ, if you know, want to know if you're a part of God's family, if you want to know that you've been born again through his grace, through his gift, like this passage is saying, the way just like an orange tree produces oranges, just like you know it's a lemon tree because it produces lemons, followers of Christ, men and women who are in the body of God, who are in his family, produce fruit that looks like God. They're gracious, they're loving, they're generous. They're not perfect, but there's an external evidence of an inward working. And so what James is saying is if you wanna know if you've received this gift, if you're walking in this gift, what is the fruit that's coming out of your life? He goes a little further, look what he says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. He's emphasizing it. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. What a word for our world right now. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because our anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. In our culture right now, there's frustration, there's fear, there's anxiety, and there's this anger. And listen, God's not mad if you have anger. If you're struggling with anger, there's injustice in the world. There's reasons to be angry, but the Bible is very careful about how we manage our anger. The Bible says, in your anger, don't sin. And when this, what James is saying here is, is, I understand, you're facing trials, you're facing challenges, you're facing temptations, but when you face those things and anger begins to well up on the inside of you and you feel this anger coming on you, be careful what you do with that anger because that anger does not produce the righteousness God's looking for. Which begs the question, what is the righteousness that God's looking for? You know, sometimes we struggle with this word righteousness. It sounds like a church word that we really don't know what it means. Does it mean go to church all the time? Does it mean be real like religious in all your thinking? And what does that mean? Here's simply what the righteousness God's looking for. Righteousness really is a word that means right standing with God. And the only way to have right standing with God, and if anyone knew this, James knew this, The only way to have right standing with God is not to do a bunch of religious stuff. It's not to do more good things than bad things so at the end at your kind of cosmic scale you would level off and be more good than bad. A lot of times we think that's what it means. It's not what it means. The righteousness that God's looking for, the righteousness of God is a righteousness that doesn't come from ourselves. It's a gift that comes from Jesus. And because it comes from Jesus, because we don't produce it out of our good works, out of our effort, out of our try harder, like we close our rings on our Apple Watch, because it's a gift that comes from this loving God who lived a life that we should have lived but couldn't, who died the death in our place that we deserve, because that's the way that the righteousness comes into our lives. It doesn't produce anger that looks at someone else and says, what's wrong with you? If you were just, you would be more like me. It produces a humility that says the only way to be right with God is a posture of grace and humility. And instead of holding people out of anger to a righteous standard, it invites broken people into a loving, redemptive relationship with God. What does the anger in your life produce Does it produce self-righteousness and a reason to judge people and to put people in a box? Or does it cause you to overflow with the grace, with the mercy, with the compassion that you've received from God that you freely extend to someone else? And when you do that, you cooperate with the Spirit of God and His grace begins to move through your life and it activates the gifts that He's given you. That's what you and I need. That's the hope for our nation. That's the hope for your family. That's the hope for your workplace. That's the hope for your soul. Not an anger that makes you fix it. It's an anger that leads you to be desperate for God's presence. Before I pray for you, I wanna just give you three simple thoughts. What does it mean to say our gifts are spiritual? Well, the first thing is this. Spiritual immaturity will minimize the impact of your gift. James is highlighting this idea of desire and sin, this process. Here's what he's saying. Guys, your immaturity, your inability to walk through challenging seasons is gonna minimize your ability to follow God in the way that he's called you to follow him. Your potential, your gift can be stopped because you're immature. We all know what it's like to have people in our lives who are incredibly gifted. We love their gift. We love what their gift produces. They're really good at what they do. It's like, it just comes from God. 
But here's the thing. We also know what it's like to have people who are really gifted, whose character and attitude and the things they say, we don't even really want to be around them. And eventually we come to a point where we say, you know what? Yes, they're gifted, but it's not worth all the drama and the baggage that comes with the gift. So how do, you, how do you prevent yourself from ending up in that category? Well, here's what I would say. Two primary areas of immaturity. The first is secret sin. And the reason why I call it secret sin is because we all have sin. We all have challenges where we're growing. And it's okay. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He wants us to make progress. And here's how that works. The Bible says that if we're faithful to confess our sin, he's faithful to, to forgive us from all unrighteousness. So the issue isn't, it's bad if you have sin, that makes you immature. No, sin doesn't make you immature. Actually, maturity is the ability to recognize your own sin and to repent quickly. Secret sin is when you think, well, because my gift's still working, because I'm still productive, because I'm still operating and leading, that I can handle this. And, and we all know so many stories of people who thought they could handle it until they couldn't, and their life blew up, and you realize there was this whole secret life that they never told anybody because they thought they could handle it. So we have to deal with secret sin. And the second thing is, as we've been saying, this emotional instability. There's so much emotion swirling in our world, and technology has been helpful because technology can help us connect, but the challenge of technology is technology can get you to make an emotional reaction and to be emotionally driven by things that don't have anything to do with you. And one of the greatest signs of maturity is not that you're dead in your emotions, but that you have self-control and you understand the appropriate response to things that you have a, a reason to react to and things that you don't need to react because they have nothing to do with you. Here's the second thing. God supernaturally empowers you in the area of your gift. Man, this is such good news. He supernaturally empowers you. See, your gift, the impact of your gift is not just about how hard you're willing to work and how disciplined you can be at developing your gift. Those things are important. Those things are a function of stewardship. But when we talk about the impact of your gift, there's this whole other category. There's this whole other factor. When God puts his hand on your gift and anoints you in the area that you've been gifted, there's this exponential breakthrough, this exponential growth. If you've ever seen someone use their gift in that way where God anoints them, you, go, you ask them, how did you do that? They're like, I don't even know. I don't even know, I just did it. Maybe you've seen someone with the gift of leadership or a gift of, of service or a gift of giving or, or, or a gift of encouragement. You're like, how did you know what to even say to me? You said the exact same right thing at the exact right time. They're like, I don't even know. I just felt like I was supposed to say it. Why? Because God can supernaturally empower you and anoint you. That's the biblical word, anoint you. Now you hear that, you think, well, that, yeah, that's for pastors and worship leaders and people who are praying for, no, no, no. The biblical picture of anointing is so much greater than that. Because every gift is spiritual and every gift can be applied in your workplace, everywhere you go, there's an opportunity for God to anoint you. You know God can anoint you in the boardroom, in the workplace, in your cubicle, in the classroom as a student, in the classroom as a teacher, on the sports field as a coach, in the kitchen as a mom, wherever there are people who have a relationship with God who are using their gifts, God can supernaturally empower you and anoint you to do what you could never do on your own. See, that's why... Even when we work hard and we're disciplined and we're doing great things, there's something in us that goes, man, I feel like there's more. I feel like there's something deeper. Why? Because we're spiritual beings that long to be connected, not to just use our gift to accomplish things, but to use our gift in cooperation with the Spirit of God. Now that's exciting and inspiring. I hope that inspires you. Here's the one area that I would caution you. The one downside to that is this. God empowers you and anoints you in the area of your gift. He doesn't anoint you and empower you in whatever area you desire or in the area of someone else's gift, which requires you to stay humble and to stay in relationship and to stay connected to people who are gifted in ways that you're not. And this is really, really hard for us as a culture because we feel like we can do anything and we can learn anything and we can have an opinion on anything. Let me just tell you, there's a big difference between I know something and I know how to look things up, right? Like there's a big difference. The University of Chicago did a study recently and it found that in our college education, the average college student shows no improvement in the area of critical thinking over the span of their college education. That's so tragic. Here's what that means. 
Kids and students and people in our world today, just because you can Google something doesn't mean that you're an expert at it, right? Expertise is still a thing. How many of you have had a friend who's a doctor? How many of you have gone to a doctor? The doctor's gone to, to, to school for years and years, and every year in their practice, they call it a practice for a reason. They're practicing, they're learning, they're seeing things, and the patient comes in and says, here's my symptoms. And the doctor goes, well, here's your problem, and the patient goes, nope, you're wrong. I looked on WebMD. That's crazy. But that's where we live as a world today. We think, well, I have an opinion, and my opinion's valid because I did a Google search and I looked something up. It's challenging, it's hurting us. We need the humility to be willing to say, you know what, I don't know everything. I talked about being blinded. Here's another one of those cognitive bias. This is, it's happened so much, there's a name for it. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know who Dunning or Kruger were, but you don't wanna be named after this. But we all do this. Dunning-Kruger effect is when you're overconfident and you have a limited ability and you have low self-awareness. You're out of your lane and you're acting like your opinion is just as valid as someone who's gifted, appointed, and anointed. Now you might hear me thinking, well that's just you from an authoritative position trying to push people back. No, it's a grace to you. You don't have to be an expert in everything and God gives other people in our lives to empower and and to strengthen us and we benefit when we trust others. Which brings us to the last thing. Obedience amplifies the impact of your gift. Obedience amplifies the impact of your gift. I think about these phrases that James ends this little section of scripture with. Man, if there's anything we need in our world, like I said, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. You know that last one, slow to get angry? It's only mentioned nine times in the Old Testament, that phrase, and every time slow to get angry is only referring to one person, and that person is God. Think about that. What James is saying is when you're slow to be angry, you're acting more like God. God has lots and lots of reasons to be angry, to be upset, but aren't you gracious? It's funny how we want God to be slow to be angry when we're the ones who've messed up but we want them to be quick to be angry when somebody else has hurt or violated us. When you think about quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, I think about it and I laugh because as a younger brother, that does not describe the mentality of younger brothers. We don't typically work that way. What in the world would motivate James to think that way? Only by the grace of God. You know, and here's the other thing, the last thing I wanna leave you with before I pray for you. I was thinking about this week, I've never thought about this before. I think the Holy Spirit really helped me to see it. It really encouraged me. It really made me think about this. Do you know in the book of James, there's not one place where James refers to Jesus as his older brother. He could have. He could have said, guys, listen to me. My big brother, he's kind of a big deal. He could have said, my brother used to say this. Or here's what my brother says. He never does. It's not because it's not true. It's because James' primary relationship with Jesus, think about this, his primary relationship with Jesus was not brother, it was Lord. And whatever you relate to Jesus as determines the nature of your relationship. If you look at Jesus as consultant, if you look at Jesus as life coach, you determine the kind of relationship that you'll get from him. And I think we think, oh, God wants me to obey him because he's insecure, because he needs my worship. It's not true. God wants us to obey him, not because it benefits him, but because it's the greatest doorway. It's the pathway. It's the opportunity to the life we're all longing for. It's so hard for us, but it's obedience. Obedience is the way to spiritual power in your life. Obedience is the way to anointing. Obedience is the way to discovering your gift. It may not be popular, it may not be easy, but it's the path that he laid out for each and every one of us. If you'll say, God, I'm not looking to you when it's convenient. God, I don't just come to you when I want you to agree with what I've already determined in my heart. God, I'm coming to you as your child as your servant, whatever you ask of me, the answer is yes. If his younger brother could do that, how much more should you and I be the kind of people who say, Jesus, listen, you're not just my life coach, you don't just empower my gifts, everything that I have in my life is from you, I recognize that, 
and I humbly give you everything that I have. Let's pray. Jesus, we sense your presence. Lord, you have no shadow of turning. Lord, you have no need that you would look to us to obey you. But in your generosity, in your love, in your kindness, because you see the gift that your Father placed in each of us, you call us to a life of discovering and growing and walking in our gifts. Lord, we recognize the greatest gift that you give is the gift of peace with God. Maybe you're you're listening to me and watching online and you've never thought of it that way. You didn't know that a relationship with Jesus was about surrendering your heart and saying, I'm not perfect, I can never be perfect, but Jesus, you're perfect. You had a perfect relationship with God, with a perfect Father who loves you perfectly, and by the gift of God, you give that to us, just right where you're at. All you have to do is just simply say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you, I receive your righteousness as my own. I put my hope and my faith and my trust in you. He'll come and he'll fill you with his grace and his gift and his love. Maybe you've already prayed that prayer. Do you know your gift? Are you using your gift? Are you trusting that God wants to work in you and through you? Are you willing to look at the gifts of the lives of others? God, I'm praying that you'd help each of us wherever we're at in this journey to discover our gift, to to make obedience the primary goal, to, to stay in the area that you've anointed us and empowered us, Lord, that we might use that gift to glorify your name and to serve others so that your kingdom could be advanced so the whole world would see there's a different way to love, there's a different way to live, there's a different way to serve. In Jesus' name, amen.